All right, welcome to Quick Show. My name is Greg Matson, and I am your host. In this episode, we're talking about a day of reckoning. This is a virtual event that is coming up on March 30th, sponsored by the Isaiah Institute with a keynote speaker, Avraham Gileadi. Now, before I go into this any deeper, I really want to talk about, well, I want to watch your appetite a bit in, in understanding some things about Isaiah. We've had some recent Come Follow Me lessons in the last two, three weeks where we've really gone over a lot of Isaiah. And again, what are we used to doing? We're kind of used to just going right through those, maybe browsing a little bit, but blowing through those Isaiah chapters and then getting right back to Nephi's words, right? The problem with that is that all of Nephi's words are built around Isaiah. And, and here's what I mean by this. If we go back to Second Nephi 11, Right, And you look in here and you see, here it, right in verse 2, it says, And now I, Nephi, write more of the words of Isaiah. Right, He's obsessed with Isaiah. For my soul delighteth in his words. For I will liken his words unto my people. Now, why can he do that? He's not stretching something out. He, he's not looking at Isaiah's words and saying, Well, yeah, I guess that kind of applies here to my people. Isaiah's words apply to, number one, all people. They apply especially to the Nephites, and they even more so apply especially to us in the last days. What we get with Isaiah is someone who completely understands the patterns of the rise and fall of civilizations, patterns that rise off of inspiration and adherence to godly principles, and then begin to decay as the people turn from those godly principles. And he's able to take the existing nation states of the time, right? Assyria, the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, Babylon, and Egypt, he throws in Syria here, is here and there as well, and and can bring them in as the actors on this global stage and see how they interact. Who's falling away from certain cultural principles that build and edify a civilization? Who's getting weaker? Who then, by strength, military strength, is going to overpower that other civilization, that other nation state? These power dynamics and spiritual dynamics are always at play on earth. And what was happening in Isaiah's time with a loss of Christ and a loss of liberty happens to the people of Nephi, and he knows this. He's seen this in vision. What he sees in vision that will happen to his own people is what happened at Isaiah's, in Isaiah's lifetime and beyond as well. And those same things are going to happen and are happening already with us in the last days. So there is a pattern in place, Isaiah's pattern, Nephi's, the Nephites' pattern, right? Both of them end the same way. They end in destruction. And then here we are. Not only do we have Isaiah's words, we have the Nephite prophet's words, the Book of Mormon. These are the words of a people whose civilization completely fell apart. And now are we going to take those words? and heed them. That's Nephi's message. That's Isaiah's message. So when Isaiah is talking about the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom of Judah and Assyria and Babylon and Egypt, etc., these are also actors and cultural influences and power dynamics that happened during the time of the Nephites. And even more so, because Isaiah is very focused on the last days. They are players, actors on the global stage today, following the exact same patterns. And Nephi is going to show you this. So Nephi likens his words and then says, And I will send them forth unto all my children, for he verily saw my Redeemer, even as I have seen him. So I get this message here from Nephi. Number one, he wants to focus in on the Savior. And he's going to do that with all of the chapters. There's 13 chapters here of Isaiah. He's going to go in here and focus in on these 13 chapters. And there are numerous 
allusions and direct statements about the Savior in these chapters that he inserts. But there's a second thing that Nephi wants to talk about. In verse 5, he says, And also my soul delighteth in the covenants of the Lord, which he hath made to our fathers. Right? Think of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Abrahamic covenant. Yea, my soul delighteth in his grace and in his justice and power and mercy in the great and eternal plan of deliverance from death. Right? Now, when we see death, again, anciently, we need to think first of judgment in hell and then of mortal death. So those covenants are what bring us out of judgment in hell that redeem us, right? And the Savior, obviously, is the crux of all of this. So the Savior and the Abrahamic covenant. And this is the gospel. This is the restored gospel. When we talk about the fullness of the gospel in the Book of Mormon, it is about the redeeming sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the Abrahamic covenant. Why? Because what is the work and glory of the Father? It is bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. So the Abrahamic covenants and the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ are means toward that work, toward exaltation. And this is the bird's eye view that Isaiah takes. This is the bird's eye view that Nephi takes. And as he looks at these two things, he inserts these next 13 chapters. Interestingly, the first chapter that is inserted here is Isaiah 2. And immediately, right, we get here in verse 2, and it shall come to pass in the last days when the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. Why is that so important? Because that is where the Abrahamic covenant takes place. The ordinances and covenants of the temple. And then interestingly, you're going to get all of this discussion about those that are lofty or those that are humble, those that are haughty, those that are bowed down, those that are exalted, those that are proud and lofty, those that are lifted up will be brought low. This is all the context for Lehi's vision, his dream of the great and spacious building and the tree of life. These are the opposites. He goes on and think. he comes in here to chapter 3 and think about our day and what happened in the 20th century, right? And, and this is a warning to us. The same things happen in verse 4, and I will give children unto them to be their princes and babes shall rule over them. How does that happen? Stop and think. How does that come to pass? And verse 5, And the people shall be oppressed, every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. This is all what is happening with these philosophies of men today, right? With, with all of the critical theories that divide everyone between victim and oppressor. Eventually, Everybody is an oppressor, one to another. It is the most brilliant, dark way to divide anything. And by the way, if you look at chap chapter 13 here, which is Isaiah 3, you go from verse 1 all the way down to, I'm going to say 8, right? It is a chiasmus, right? And what is at the very center of what is being stated here? Verse 5, and the people shall be oppressed every one by another. This is the result. This is the center of the crux of all these statements here in verse 8, or uh, th verses 1 through 8. And verse 9, the show of their countenance doth witness against them and doth declare their sin to be even as Sodom. And I would suggest that this goes beyond just one type of sex or orientation. I think that this is absolute throwing off the shackles, the liberation of sexual, we'll call it independence. And again in verse 12, And my people, children are the oppressors, and women rule over them. See, these things aren't new, right? The, the, these movements, these ideologies are things that happen over and over again because we, we have a human nature. We have a social nature. 
We have a nature between the genders and things move back and forth over time. And who is the last line of defense in a civilization, spiritually, emotionally? It's the women. And here in verse 16, Moreover, the Lord saith, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty, proud, and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go and making a tinkling of their feet, therefore the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion. Okay, so ultimately it is, it is the women ultimately then then that are holding up the last virtues of society when they fall then everything is done. You have moved from a, a perhaps a much more masculine society with too much power given to masculine tendencies all the way over to now a very feminized society where, yes, toxic femininity begins to take over. And where does that toxic femininity come, come from? Well, it's how the adversary works on any of us, right? It's our weaknesses. One of the weaknesses of women, so to speak, would be compassion. That's where you would attack. And that's how these ideologies today are spreading malevolent compassion. They lead with compassion. That is the carrot. But eventually, they end with a stick. Quick statement here in... Second Nephi 15 from Isaiah, Therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge and their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. And everybody is brought down, right? And the mean man shall be brought down in verse 15. Mean man is going to mean the more crude man. The lower classes are brought down and the mighty man shall be humbled. And the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. What comes into a society that, that allows these things to start happening? And are we moving toward that right now or are we moving away from it? This is what Isaiah is talking about. And this is why Lehi and Nephi love Isaiah so much. It applies directly to what they saw in their visions about their own people. The same problems. And so the Book of Mormon becomes this incredible tool if we view it this way as an instruction manual of how things fall apart. And even though the Nephites had the writings of Isaiah, they allow the exact same thing to happen. And currently, we are certainly in the West now allowing the exact same things to happen. Just the last thing I'm going to dip into here this is 2 Nephi 15, verse 20. We've all heard this one. This is where it ends up. And this is where we are pretty close to right now. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. How does that happen? Well, we move our values. We bring lower values up above higher values. Evil does not come about by saying, hey, do you want to be evil? Evil comes about by saying, this is good. This is good, and I can justify this. And then an entire culture changes by justifying a brand new morality. Does that sound familiar to you? Well, what does this bring us to? It brings us to eventually a day of reckoning as is discussed in the book of Isaiah, chapter 10, verse 3. That's what this virtual event is. It is a virtual conference called a Day of Reckoning, where it's led by keynote speaker Avraham Gileadi, who I've had on the show a couple of times, and several other speakers. In fact, uh, Todd McLaughlin, who was just on earlier this week, will be one of the speakers talking about the priesthood. If you want to learn more about Isaiah... You should attend this event. It's going to help you understand not only the book of Isaiah, but the book of Mormon that we are reading this year. You can go to bookofmormonisaiah.com slash conference. Again, bookofmormonisaiah.com slash conference and sign up, register for the conference. I will be there listening. 
when we understand Isaiah, we understand the Book of Mormon. When we understand Isaiah, we understand the times that we live in. I'll talk to you later.